The Genome is Deepcool's extreme liquid cooling solution, a stylish case with an integrated LED backlit captain pump and CPU block, 360mm radiator, and helix-style reservoir to keep your system running cool and quiet. Click the link in the description for more information. Excellent! AMD launched their Ryzen 5 lineup of CPUs today with four new processors sporting either four cores with eight threads or six cores with 12 threads. This should prove to be an exciting launch as the R5s are priced between 170 and 250 US dollars, the 1400 and 1500X at 170 and 190 respectively with four cores and eight threads, and the 1600 and 1600X at 220 and 250 with six cores and 12 threads. All CPUs are unlocked for overclocking when paired with a B350 or X370 chipset AM4 motherboard, so although I'll only be testing the 1500X and 1600X today, I think the 1400 and 1600 will be the chips to get if you're willing to do a bit of overclocking on your own. Speaking of which, I'll be back tomorrow as well with a video dedicated to overclocking Ryzen 5 CPUs, so get subscribed to my channel if you're not already, and uh, make sure to turn those notifications on too so you won't miss out. For today, I want to focus on performance benchmarks rather than the architecture details and specs that you guys probably already know about if you've been following Ryzen for the past month. So here's a rundown of what I will be comparing. The unlocked 4-core, four 4-thread four 7600K from Intel has been the go-to processor for quite some time when it comes to building a gaming PC, so that will be the primary competition from the Intel side. I've also got the 8-core 16-thread Ryzen 7 1700 to pit against the 1500X and 1600X, giving us a 4-horse race. Test configurations are always tricky to decide on, so here's my MO for today. I wanted to overclock, but I wanted to keep things reasonable. So I'm running everything reasonably overclocked. I chose speeds that I think just about anybody can hit with some basic overclocking and maybe a $30 to $50 air cooler. So my Ryzen CPUs are all running at 3.9 gigahertz on all cores, and my 7600K is at 4.8 gigahertz on all cores. This should represent the low end of the overclocking ranges that these chips can all hit, and it should also be a suitable 24-7 overclock, depending on your specific silicon, of course, if you're trying to dial the same thing at home. For memory, I kind of did the same, two 8 gig DDR4 kits running at 2933 on both platforms with all timing set to 16, 16, 16, 39. Finally, I ran all tests with the same GPU, the Galax GTX 1070 EXOC Sniper, which was also overclocked, so it was running at about 2025 megahertz on the GPU well under full load. So the questions that I'm hoping to answer today are, will the 1070 perform the same across all platforms, indicating that an R5 1400 quad core is all you really need? Will AMD's performance at 1080 continue to suffer compared to the 7600K with its better instructions per clock performance? And can we finally build a really nice gaming PC for less than $1,000 that has more than four freaking threads at its disposal? Let's run down the hardware I'm using and then dive into the benchmarks. So for our AM4 system, we have an ASUS Crosshair 6 Hero motherboard. This is an X370 chipset board, so do bear that in mind. B350 is what AMD recommends you pair an R5 with, but for the sake of comparison to some older benchmarks, as well as forward-looking to my overclocking video that I'm going to be doing very soon, so I stuck with the Crosshair 6 Hero. For storage, I have a Patriot Hellfire M.2 NVMe SSD. It's a 480 gig version, so that's giving us a little bit of extra performance on the storage side, but shouldn't really affect the benchmarks at all. Everything's powered by a Corsair HX 1000i power supply, and for memory, at the G-Skill Flare X 3200 speed kit, although I have downclocked that to 2933 just for this test. If you're interested to see how far that can go, again, I'm gonna be following up with an overclocking video very soon. And then for cooling, I have the Corsair H100 IV2, which is a bit overkill uh, for this platform, but again, wanted to stick with that when I do overclocking testing as well in the future. And I'm very confident that these chips, given their low TDP at 65 watts, will be able to be handled by any 35 to 50-ish dollar air cooler that you might find as well. For the Intel system, I have the Gigabyte Z270X Gaming 7 motherboard. For cooling, I have the Corsair H110 liquid CPU cooler. For memory, I have the HyperX Predator 3200 speed kit, although again, it was set to 2933 with the timings I already listed. And finally, for storage, I have the Intel 600P NVMe SSD in the 512 gig version. 
And now finally we can dive into the benchmarks, starting with Cinebench R15, of course. And uh, for these first couple benchmarks, I do include the 7700K and FX8350 performance because I do have some numbers for those. But the 1700, of course, destroying everything else with its multi-threaded performance with all 12, I'm sorry, all 16 of its threads available, followed up by the 1600X, then the 7700K, then 7600K. Uh, looking at the single thread performance numbers here, the 7600K with a score of 205 definitely has the advantage here when it comes to the single thread score, but we'll see if that helps out through the rest of the benchmarks. Now to handbrake, just re-encoding a 4K video down to 1080. The fastest times are the winner here, and of course the 1700 wins again with all of its threads. 1600X coming in second with a time just shy of 10 minutes, followed by the 7700K and 7600K. 7600K definitely being helped out by its 4.8 gigahertz overclock there, and actually almost catching up to the 7700K. And then we have the 1500X bringing up the rear here. Unfortunately, SMT did not seem to help it overtake the 7600K in this test. Moving into the gaming benchmarks, starting with the synthetic 3D Mark Firestrike Ultra. Here we can see the overall score remaining roughly the same for all of these systems. So that would tell us that we don't necessarily need, if all we're uh, doing is testing 3D Mark, of course, we don't necessarily need the higher end processor like you might need with the 7600K or 1700. However, you do see a pretty huge difference when it comes to the physics test, which is the more CPU focused test in 3D Mark. And we will again see how that continues to play out with the rest of the benchmarks. 3D Mark Time Spy is a DirectX 12 benchmark, also synthetic, of course. And here we can see the R7 1700 shining in both the overall performance as well as the CPU performance. 1600X as well, I think largely due to that CPU score, was able to overtake the 7600K in this test. So in situations when the CPU is taken more into account than the GPU, you can see better performance from the 1600X than the 7600K. Moving into actual games, this is GTA 5 at 1080, and I'm running all these benchmarks, by the way, at 1080 and 1440. Uh, here we can see the 1500X kind of starting to tank, and uh, I think this is going to be a continuing trend, as we see that four cores is not quite keeping up as well as it should, of course, depending on what you're doing. The 7600K did seem to do all right, uh, although it again trailed behind the 1600X and the 1700. Do also pay attention to the low scores here. They're, these are the 1% and 0.1% slowest frame times, uh, so it's a bit better way of determining if you're going to see any choppiness compared to just showing the minimum frame rate. At 1440, we see a little bit more of an equalization when it comes to the 7600K, 1600X, and 1700, but the 1500X, again, showing that in a CPU-bound, somewhat CPU-bound game like GTA 5 that does like more CPU performance and more threads, uh, a 1500X isn't quite keeping up. The 7600K did still do a good job, although you can see it starting to trail when it comes to those low scores. Civ 6 is kind of an odd game to benchmark. I did it at 1080 and 1440, and it didn't, didn't show that much of a difference between the two resolutions, which I think is kind of funny for a game like this. I think there's some scaling thing going on, but it does show that it does like more threads, uh, more cores with the CPU as the 1600X and 1700. Definitely came out with a win here, albeit by a sort of sl slim margin. 7600K coming in third, and then the 1500X trailing behind once again. At 1440, we see a little, little bit more of equivalency. We see, actually see a slightly higher average frame rate, which is weird since the, compared to 1080, it's, uh, yeah, I, I don't have a very good explanation for that. But again, we can see that most of the CPUs are keeping up with the 1070, whereas the 1500X is again falling behind a bit. Moving on to Metro Last Light, still a very relevant game when it comes to benchmarking performance. And here again, we can see the 1500X not quite keeping up, 7600K doing a little bit better than that 1600X and 1700 sticking right with it. Uh, I do want to again point to the low scores on the 7600 uh, being a little bit lower than I might expect actually and I do want to reference here that when it comes to smoothness in gaming uh, that's sort of been referenced with the Ryzen processors quite a bit and I've tried to pay attention to it a little bit more I know it's sort of anecdotal but I did feel like all the benchmarks when I was running felt very smooth on the Ryzen system. So, so the 0% scores are something to be taken into consideration, especially looking at Metro Last Light here in 1440. We can see that the 7600K had the highest average frame rate, but did seem to suffer when it came to those 0.1% lows. And that was indicative of some of the uh, bits of hitches and stutters that I saw while the benchmark was actually running. Witcher 3 at 1080 uh, saw roughly equivalent scores across all the chips, although we do see a bit of a step down as we go down the line. 1500X actually came up big here, uh, outperforming the 1700 and 1600X, which I thought was, was kind of interesting, but uh, the performance really isn't that far off with any of them. Although we can see here again the 7600K coming away with the best average frame rate, but again, the worst 0% one low score. 
Moving over to 1440, uh, the game becomes a little bit more GPU bound than CPU bound, so the CPU doesn't matter quite as much, although we do again see the 1500X coming in last, uh, everything else performing roughly equivalently, with the 7600K coming out with a bit of a win uh, by about three or four frames per second. Moving on to Overwatch, uh, the 1500X actually had a really good score here, 194 average and a very good 0% and 0.1% lows as well. The 7600K, I have no very good explanation for in this test. I'll be perfectly honest, this was the very last test of all of the benchmarks that I ran with the 7600K. I came out with just some anomalous numbers. I tried to investigate, I re-ran the test several times. I don't have a good explanation for this, but just bear in mind, take that one at least with a grain of salt, um, because it was the last benchmark I ran and I didn't have time to investigate it further. If I move to 1440 though, you'll see that the scores are pretty much the same across the board. There was really minimal variance. 7600K did have a lower 0.1 and 1% scores in this one, but all, by and large, it was still the same. So no good explanation for my 1080 scores with the 7600K, but all in all, Overwatch is easily handled by any of these processors. Now, I've already mentioned that I'm using fairly high-end coolers for these, uh, all-in-one closed-loop coolers, a 240 rad on that one and a 280 rad on the Intel one, but I do still want to list temps. Uh, I did measure them, uh, at least with the Ryzen processors, I was measuring with the Ryzen Master software uh, at the peak temperature during my uh, handbrake encode. Hit 73 degrees Celsius at the hottest on the R7-1700. Uh, that does have a higher TDP, so that kind of makes sense. 7600K was staying pretty chilly, 72 degrees at 4.8 gigahertz. Bear in mind, that these different CPUs, uh, Ryzen versus Intel, have different uh, charts when it comes to the actual peak temperatures that they can hit. So 72 is on the cooler side for Intel, whether, whereas it's a little bit more on the warmer side for AMD. 1600X hit 65 degrees at 3.9 gigahertz, and the 1500X hit only 56 degrees. So that is one of the nice benefits of having the quad core as opposed to the six cores, is they do generate less heat. A final slide here is a frames per dollar slide, and uh, basically I took all of the actual gaming tests, not the synthetics, added up the frame rate for them. This is not the most scientific way of doing this, but I wanted to give some sort of aggregate here at the end. So total frames produced by all the cards are listed there. And then the retail prices are also listed there. Uh, current MSRP for the AMD chips and then the current retail price at Newegg for the 7600K, which was 240 bucks. Here we can see when it comes to frames per dollar or frames per $100, uh, we're actually getting the best bang for our buck out of the R5 1500X. But that is largely in part thanks to its lower price by about a good 60 bucks. Uh, we have actually pretty dead heat uh, when it comes to the 7600K versus the 1600X. Uh, and I would say though that the uh, performance of the 1600X in non-gaming situations would push me over the edge to, towards getting uh, the 1600X over the 70, over the 7600K. 1700 obviously uh, comes down a bit when it comes to your bang for the buck, but you are getting additional uh, cores and threads there, which again would be useful for non-gaming situations. But this is a big reason I think why people were excited about the R5s for gaming is because you're not paying for that extra performance that you're not gonna use with the games. You're only paying for your four core or six core part, which you're gonna get a lot more use out of when it comes to actual PC gaming. So overall, I am pleased as punch with the Ryzen 5 lineup, and even more so after doing some direct comparisons to Intel's gaming performance. Obviously, the higher thread and core counts for the R5s give them a huge edge in any computing task that takes advantage of those multiple threads, but even the gaming performance seems to be at least up to par with the 7600K with some back and forth depending on the game in question. There has been clear evidence in the past month that AMD's Ryzen CPUs have a lot of power still left under the hood, and game optimizations, as well as leveraging higher RAM speeds, for example, have both already been shown to draw out more untapped performance. I think the best value in the R5 lineup will probably be the 1400 or the 1600 paired with some overclocking, which I will be showing you guys how to do in my next video. But for those who just want that out of the box experience, the XQs are still decent bangs for the bucks. Uh, you just, you know, if you want to just plug it in and have it run at a higher frequency. I would also say that if you're planning to stick with 1920 by 1080 gaming for a while, you'll be okay with the 1400 or 1500X. But if you want to game at 1440 or high refresh rate, 1080, or if you want to delve into streaming or video editing, then the 6 core 1600 or 1600X is definitely worth the investment. And hey, another seldom mentioned benefit of the AM4 platform overall is that you can buy a cheap quad core like a 1400 and still have an upgrade path to an 8 core CPU in the future without swapping your motherboard. 
So there you have it guys, another exciting launch from AMD that I think a lot more home builders will be able to get excited about since the price range is more reasonable. I wanna close with a general statement about product launches like this though. Get a second opinion. I've done a lot of work in the past few days to get this video produced and test these chips, but there's a ton of other YouTubers and tech websites out there that are also covering these chips with alternate configurations, testing more games at various other resolutions, and generally providing you guys with the information that you need to make a buying decision if you're on the fence right now. So I'll be perusing some of those this morning and adding those links to this video's description so you guys can have some place to go for further viewing and or reading. That is all for this video though. Stay tuned for the overclocking video coming very soon. Uh, hit that like button, share this video if you found it useful at all, subscribe for more videos coming very soon, uh, and of course check out the description for the links, and as always, thank you very much for watching.